Manuel is widely published on, he has published broadly on conflict, contentious politics, ethnicity in prestigious journals such as international organizations and the Journal of Conflict Resolution. And he has also recently published this wonderful book with Oxford University Press, and he will talk about it. And um, just on a personal note, um, I think there are at least three reasons why I really, really appreciate and like this book. First, it's it's deeply historical and comparative. So it looks at yeah, these patterns of colonialism and decolonization and how they impact contemporary conflict and peace by looking at the kind of forms of ethnic stratification and, and ethnic polarization um, and coloni these colonial systems left behind. Second, it's mixed methods, sort of it combines large-scale statistical analysis with detailed case studies. And third, in that context, it also jumps out of the regional, usual regional specialization we often are confined to and compares, sort of, has conducted um, detailed case studies of both in Africa and in Latin America. And so in that sense, yeah, these three things are really very dear to me. And yeah, and so I'm very happy to have you here. Yeah, and I highly recommend this book and Manuel will talk us through this. So without further delay, over to you. Fantastic. Uh, well, thanks so much for the introduction. Thanks so much for coming. And uh, well, thanks so much for inviting me, uh, especially. It's a, it's, a, it's a real pleasure being here. I was just uh, just said to Emre before, the last time I talked about my book um, live in person, right, was a year and a half ago. It was up in Glasgow. And uh, on the way back from Glasgow to London, First, ISA was canceled. The ISA conference in Hawaii, I was so looking forward to, was canceled, right? And um, and then UCL decided to uh, go online uh, on that weekend. So, um, uh, it, you know, talking about or doing this uh, book talk really brings back uh, special memories. And I'm very glad to be back in, in, in person. So thanks so much for the, the uh, invitation. Yeah, the title... Um, of the book is uh, Mobilization and Conflict in Multi-Ethnic States. So the talk is about the book, as Matthias said, and the book addresses the question, why ethnic movements are more likely to turn violent in some countries than in others. So um, it explains not only uh, why ethnic groups rebel, but also how they uh, rebel. And I uh, distinguish between um, kind of peaceful, um, direct action in the form of peaceful protest, group protest, collective uh, action, but peaceful on the one hand, and then um, civil war on the other hand, distinguishing between what's being termed governmental conflicts, conflicts over state power at the center, and territorial conflicts, which are about the status of a particular territory within the state. Usually these are about autonomy or, or outright secession, right? Um, so the Basque conflict in this country here, uh, the Catalan um, uh, conflict obviously are uh, territorial uh, conflict or examples of territorial conflicts. Now, ethno-political mobilization in whatever form has become one of the key defining characteristics of post-World War II politics, right? Uh, ranging all the way from the civil rights movement to ethnic voting in Europe uh, uh, to some of the most, some of the bloodiest um, uh, conflict in, in recent um, history. Um, I define ethnic groups, um, that's following uh, kind of the uh, a standard approach in, in political science, following Max Weber. Um, I identify, uh, sorry, I uh, uh, define ethnic groups as self identifying communities um, that are held together by a belief in some sort of a common ancestry, a shared uh, culture. And this belief is nurtured by some sort of like, you know, quasi-objective uh, features that you can observe, such as language uh, that is shared among the members of this community, religion, or certain phenotypical uh, uh, features, right? And by extension, then, ethnic movements um, are defined as organized political campaigns by such ethnic groups to influence state policy, either in favor or to alter uh, 
the status quo, right? As I said, um, ethnic mobilization has become one of the defining characteristics of post-World War II politics. So it's not surprising that um, they have also played a, a, an important role in uh, civil wars in that period. This graph is based on data that we collected at um, ETH Zurich, where I did my uh, uh, postdoc, and it shows the number of ongoing civil wars. Um, it's the gray line, and then the number of ethnic and non-ethnic conflicts over time. And you can see that with the exception, well, at the very beginning and just the most recent years, um, most civil wars uh, in the post-World War II period have, uh, been uh, have been fought along ethnic lines, right? And we should also not forget that civil wars um, have been the most or have been the dominant form of political violence in that same period, right? So that just kind of shows again how ethnicity, how important ethnicity has become um, in politics in uh, this uh, modern period. But at the same time, there are also a lot of um, very important cases of ethnic groups mobilizing against very profound inequalities in peaceful ways, right? I mentioned the civil rights movement before, but we see other uh, conspicuous cases such as in Bolivia, Ecuador, Brazil, and so on, right? So um, that brings us back to the question that I uh, raised at the beginning and that's at the center of my book. How do we explain these discrepancies, right? Why are some um, ethnic movements more likely to turn violent than others, why are some countries more likely to see violent ethno-political mobilization compared to uh, peaceful ones? And I think the answer to this question also helps us um, uh, understand how violence in the most conflict-prone countries can be avoided and ultimately provide some answers um, to pressing policy questions about how to handle identity uh, uh, politics. And I will talk a bit more about the implications at the very end of the talk. Um, but I'll start with uh, a little bit of like uh, trying to situate the book in the broader literature. Uh, and then um, before um, kind of uh, explaining my argument in more detail um, and showing you some of the, the, the results of, I will focus here uh, on the quantitative statistical uh, part of the book and uh, uh, leave the case studies uh, for you so uh, I get to hopefully some, uh, some uh, you know, to kind of promote the sales of my, of my book, right? <laughs> so one thing that is very, there's I think a, a very important characteristic of the, of the existing literature um, that most studies, and that's certainly true for most quantitative studies, right? They typically focus on one outcome of uh, uh, political contention, either violent uh, contention, usually in the form of civil war, right? Or, on the other hand, nonviolent contention, typically protests, right? But there are very few studies, and especially very few quantitative studies, that actually simultaneously look at these two different outcomes of uh, political contention. And that's, I think, problematic because um, we cannot, it doesn't allow us to answer the question why are some movements more likely to turn violent than uh, using peaceful? Uh, means, right? To answer this question, we need to have some sort of a, or we need to combine uh, these two outcomes and look at these two outcomes in one single uh, study, right? So take the, um, the example of uh, the, the so-called uh, grievances um, literature, right? So that's the, the I would say, the, the strand of the literature that has taken um, the, the issue, the concept of ethnicity most seriously, right? Um, so the idea here is that 
ethnicity lends itself to kind of categorical inequality going all the way back to uh, the way Tilly saw categorical inequality, right? So ethnicity lends itself to create, to creating this, these kind of a uh, group, um, this kind of group inequality, which then uh, creates collective grievances, which leads to uh, violent conflict, according to um, a, a very important um, part of the, uh, the literature. However, um, going back to the example of Ecuador here, right? So if you uh, see this kind of set of uh, countries that I referred to before, it's not clear um, that the grievances in a country like uh, Cote d'Ivoire, which saw a, a civil war, would be uh, stronger than the grievances in, in Ecuador, right? If anything, probably indigenous people in Ecuador, um, not only that they are quite sizable too, but also they probably, historically speaking, have much, should have much stronger grievances than the uh, northerners uh, that rebelled in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, right? So why do we see, if grievances are a decisive factor, why do we see civil war in Cote d'Ivoire, but not in, uh, not in Ecuador, right? So this, this set of uh, examples that I mentioned before poses a problem to grievances-based theories, because very clearly, strong grievances do not seem to result in more extreme forms of contention. Ultimately, as Genoeth and Ulfelder put it, grievances-based explanations uh, are probably better in explaining uh, why groups rebel uh, than in explaining how they rebel. And to uh, give answers to the question, how, how groups rebel, whether in violent or in peaceful form, we need to focus more on uh, factors such as mobilization capacity of groups and the political opportunity structure. Now, interestingly, there's obviously a vast literature that has talked about these factors, but what is very interesting here is that they actually do not really focus on ethnicity, right? So the grievances-based theories are those who focus, uh, that focus on uh, ethnicity, whereas the literature on mobilization capacity, political opportunity structure typically has focused on uh, variables such as the political regime, right? Democracy, autocracy, the murder in the middle, um, uh, poverty, right? Which lowers opportunity costs for individuals to participate in violent movements, state strength, of course, geography, uh, and so on. But again, right? So if you compare Cote d'Ivoire to Bolivia, it's not quite clear why in a case like Bolivia, you know, if you walk around in the Bolivian highlands, you see plenty of poor people with certainly very low opportunity cost to, to, to join some sort of a, an armed movement. There is enough uh, mountainous terrain here to hide all sorts of guerrilla forces. Um, and, 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 uh, and certainly the, uh, there was enough political instability in Bolivia too, to open some sort of windows of opportunity, all right? So again, um, this, these arguments obviously have their merit and they're important, right? Uh, to explain part of the, uh, the outcome, but they are not fully uh, convincing either. Then there is this um, growing literature on institutional legacies, uh, post-colonial uh, 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 or, or, or colonial legacies. Um, the idea here is to trace back a, a range of uh, present-day outcomes to, um, to uh, colonial uh, policies right? Especially economic development, but also inequality and, 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 and conflict. The most prominent uh, uh, representatives of this trend, probably, uh, apart from Matthias, uh, <laughs> are Arce Moglu and Robinson, right? And, but what is interesting here is that if you, um, if you look at the cases that I mentioned before, for example, Bolivia, Ecuador, right? These are countries that Archimogul and Robinson would call countries with bad institutions. And yet, well, first of all, you know, if you, so one, one detail here is that, you know, Archimogul and Robinson really uh, emphasized the equality created by institutions in, in, in the US and Australia and Canada and so on compared to Latin America. But, I mean, this equality is entirely limited to the settlers themselves, right? And apart from that, it's very clear, white over everyone else. So that's a detail that they often do not really talk about. 
But what is more important here when it comes to the outcome of um, ethno-political mobilization, you actually see that the, you know, the patterns and outcome of ethno-political mobilization in cases like Bolivia and Ecuador are surprisingly similar to those observed in the US, right? Which is a country with totally different institutions compared to, uh, to uh, Bolivia and Ecuador. So my feeling here is that, or what I want to say here is that these, this literature that focuses on these colonial institutions cannot explain surprisingly similar outcomes uh, in countries of very different institutional legacies. And then finally, there is also a, a large and growing literature on nonviolent contention. That goes back to what I said at the beginning, right? So there are, there's a vast literature on civil war, and then there's another vast literature that is really focused on nonviolent mobilization. And these two literatures do not really speak to each other, or at least um, that, that kind of cross-fertilization, as they say today, right, is still at, in the beginnings, right? Um, I draw a lot on this literature, and I think it has, um, it has um, very important, uh, it makes a very important contribution in the sense of focusing on the actors themselves, on coalitions, the dynamics of contention, for example, fragmented versus more centralized movements and how that affects the likelihood of violence. So I draw a lot on this literature uh, for parts of my argument, but there is also a little bit of a neglect of structural conditions. And there is a lot of emphasis on the idea of strength in numbers. So the idea here is that large, uh, large groups are more likely to use nonviolent means of contention because they don't need to use violence, right? The numbers they can mobilize are enough to impress the government to make concessions. And it's small groups or groups with limited mobilization potential that need to resort to violence because they don't have the numbers, right? But what is a bit strange here is that if you look at Latin America, so for example, Chile, right? Well, the Mapuche don't make up that large uh, part of the, not that large part of the population, right? So in other Latin America, the same is true, right? Many of these groups are actually quite small. So from that perspective, we would expect uh, these groups to be more likely to use violence precisely because their mobilization potential is quite limited, right? Uh, and certainly uh, the, the, the Albanian population in, um, in, in Serbia, in what used to be Serbia, uh, was probably much or was much larger, right? And yet um, you see the use of violence in the case of, of, of uh, Kosovo and Serbia, uh, but a smaller group smaller groups in Latin America that do not um, use violence, which goes against this idea of, of strength in numbers, right? In my argument, I um, bring together these three factors that I mentioned before, um, inequality, grievances, right? Uh, mobilization capacity and the political opportunity structure in one kind of combined theoretical framework. And I kind of integrate it all into this um, ethnic based perspective. So I link not only inequality and grievances to the idea of ethnicity, but also the other two uh, decisive factors mobilization capacity and the political opportunity structure. In particular, I argue that um, in multi-ethnic countries, ethnic groups' mobilization capacity and their opportunity structure decisively depend on what I call the ethnic cleavage type, which is basically um, the, 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 um, the division that, cre uh, that divides the, uh, the different groups in uh, the country, and I focus on two uh, components of this cleavage type. One is the degree 
of hierarchization um, between groups. Basically, the question here is, is there one group that for, um, uh, for a long time has been dominant, both politically and uh, socioeconomically in the country? And then the second factor is social integration or the degree of group social integration, which uh, refers to uh, ethnic groups embeddedness in the same socioeconomic and cultural institutions. You will see that I will measure this concept um, with the, um, or using data on religious and linguistic overlap of ethnic groups, right? So if groups speak the same language and or practice the same religion, I see that as a, an indicator of, so to speak, embeddedness, right? Integration. So that's the second um, characteristic of this cleavage type. And I argue that violent conflict is least likely under conditions of ethnic stratification. What do I mean by stratification? Ethnic stratification is a combination of both high, a high degree of hierarchization, so a very stable hierarchy between groups, plus a high degree of integration. Right? So groups are highly integrated, but at the same time, there are, they are hierarchically ordered. That's what I call stratification. And violent conflict, I argue, is least likely under the conditions of ethnic stratification because it creates an equilibrium of uh, inequality. By contrast, violent conflict is more likely uh, the more segmented ethnic groups are. There are four mechanisms at the macro level um, that lead from the ethnic cleavage type to mobilization capacity and uh, the political opportunity structure. And we'll just briefly say a few words uh, about these kind of crucial mechanisms. On the one hand, I said the first component of what I call the ethnic cleavage type is um, the degree of hierarchization, right? So that's the extent to which groups in the country are hierarchically ordered. And I argue that this hierarchical order influences mobilization capacity and political opportunity structure through two channels. On the one hand, resource mobilization on the part of the marginalized groups. And then, of course, the potential for coercion on the part of the dominant group, right? When it comes to resource mobilization, the idea is straightforward. Um, violent conflict requires uh, material resources. Uh, violent conflict is costlier than nonviolent conflict. It requires some sort of training, weapons, more sophisticated um, uh, material than nonviolent uh, uh, conflict. And in a very hierarchical society, marginalized groups are unlikely to be able to mobilize the necessary resources. And also they lack, they typically lack, and that's very important, the kind of elites that could also ideologically lead um, such a, 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 a costly endeavor as a, a sustained violence or a sustained rebellion against the state government, right? You need elites to, to lead such movements. Uh, because also they provide the ideological resources, justification. Why are we fighting, right? Usually it's elites who kind of who come up with these uh, uh, ideas. Look at, you know, you can <laughs> look at the Ivorian case, uh, uh, you know, the leaders of, of, of uh, Bete resistance against Ufebuani, these were historians, right? Um, I think even in, uh, in the case of of Catalan, which is obviously not a, a case of violent conflict, but you see there's a lot of like linguists, historians, right? It's the intellectuals that provide the ideological resources for rebellion. And in a hierarchical society, the marginalized groups often lack this type of leadership, right? Um, so the, 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 the hierarchy undermines the capacity for uh, mobilization on the part of, for armed mobilization on the part of the marginalized groups. At the same time, hierarchy also provides uh, better means for the dominant group 
uh, two cores, right? The more hierarchical group relations are, the more viable and the more successful is coercion on part of the, uh, of the dominant group, the ruling regime. Um, and that's probably most important. Um, and that's where the distinction between governmental and territorial conflicts come in. That's probably more important for conflicts at the center, right? State, uh, so, so the, uh, uh, the coercive capacity of the state is most important at the center, whereas sometimes you do see uh, kind of marginalized groups rebelling or, or, or being able to mount a challenge against the state in certain territorial pockets, right? Um, so coercive power is most important for uh, uh, governmental uh, conflicts and it should, um, it should deter such challenges, violent challenges to the center. On the other hand though, given that the hierarchy is so clear and the the power of the, the dominant group so entrenched, they might be more likely to tolerate a certain degree of peaceful resistance um, or to uh, cite Malcolm X here, to even sponsor the peaceful resistance of marginalized groups. I have to say I read the autobiography of Malcolm X after, <laughs> long after I, I started working on, on, on the book uh, idea uh, after publication. In fact, I read the autobiography last fall on my sabbatical in Florence. Um, and it was really an eye opener, right? I felt like this is, in many parts of the book, he's really saying what I had, what I had in, in mind. So if you, if you focus here on the, the, the bold uh, passages here, right? Um, basically, he talks about how so-called white philanthropists sponsored the civil rights movement um, and made sure that everything was under control. It was all peaceful, right? So you have a, uh, a, 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 a huge march of, of people that are revolting against white dominance. But in fact, as Malcolm X claims, these leaders were sponsored by uh, the white, by a group of white philanthropists, right? And that's really the, the outcome or the, the, the result of this hierarchy. You wouldn't expect, let's say, uh, Yoruba politicians sponsoring Igbo movements in Nigeria, right? Uh, but yes, in the US, you would see uh, white leaders sponsoring <laughs> a, peaceful a peaceful revolt of African Americans, right? Um, and obviously, uh, Malcolm X is quite, is quite sarcastic about that, but I do think that there is something uh, to be said about this uh, sponsorship here by the dominant group. Now, the second um, key component of what I call the ethnic cleavage type is the degree of uh, social integration, right? Again, the degree of so a group social integration refers to their embeddedness, if you will, in, in socioeconomic and cultural institutions, right? To what extent do these groups participate in the same cultural and socioeconomic uh, institutions? The more they do, the higher uh, their um, integration, right? And again, this, fa this variable influences um, mobilization capacity and the political opportunity structure um, through two mechanisms. One is that, of course, the more integrated they are in cultural terms, the more uh, difficult it is for them to find some sort of a distinctive, cohesive group identity that is important for collective mobilization, right? Why is it important? Because usually when you, especially when it comes to such costly, risky endeavors such as violent mobilization, you need very clear in-group, out-group boundaries, right? In order to mobilize people, and especially to mobilize people for violence, you need to be able who, to point out who are we and who is the enemy, right? And of course, the more integrated you are, the more difficult that becomes. Um, and also it makes it easier for individuals to kind of defect uh, in the face of, of, of risk and, and, and high costs, right? So, um, 
the, uh, the, the, the lack of a distinctive cohesive group identity uh, 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 deprives marginalized groups in stratified societies of this kind of, or, or, or undermines their mobilization potential. Again, I find this uh, quote by Malcolm X particularly uh, interesting here, right? When he talks about the effect of Christianity on, on African Americans' mobilization potential, right? So the idea that you believe in a, in a, in a white Jesus and religion tells you that, all right, guys, you're suffering here on earth. Don't worry. There is a better time to come for you. There's no need for revolt right now, right? Just be patient and turn the other cheek. Um, and that definitely, that definitely, um, at least in the words of Malcolm X here, has <laughs> contributed to um, African Americans' uh, struggle to, uh, to, to, to mobilize, right? Now, in the context of my argument, I would argue that this is particularly important for uh, when it comes to violent mobilization, because again, it's especially violence that requires these clear in-group versus out-group distinctions, right? Um, to justify uh, violence against a clearly defined enemy, right? And that's just more difficult if you share the same, uh, share the same culture, right? Attacking fellow Christians, for example, or these people speak the same language. Why are we fighting? Right? So justification of violence is, is more difficult uh, under these circumstances. And then if, um, the final uh, uh, mechanism might even be the most important one is that, of course, social integration creates interdependence. The more integrated the groups are, the more they depend on each other. Now, that is even true in, in the context of hierarchy, right? In that case, it's basically the oppressors and the oppressed depending on each other. And that decreases the opportunities for violence, but at the same time, it provides leverage to the oppressed to um, raise their voice in nonviolent um, in nonviolent ways. And that's where, where I was most influenced, I would say, by the um, by this literature on uh, nonviolent resistance, because another key argument, apart from the strength in numbers, is uh, and that goes back to uh, you know social movement, uh, uh, social movement uh, theories that peaceful mobilization works best when uh, the marginalized challenger can withhold some sort of a resource that the, the, the powerful groups depend on, right? So if you think of the case of South Africa, right? Even during the, uh, the apartheid regime, the white uh, rulers uh, uh, crucially depended on the African workforce in the mines at home and so on, right? So, and obviously <laughs> the, uh, the same workforce depended on their jobs for their own, um, as the basis of their livelihood, right? So you have this mutual in, uh, interdependence, the same in, in Ecuador, right? So you have these urban white elites that rule the country, but at the same time, they're really dependent on the indigenous food producers in the countryside. So there is this kind of mutual uh, dependence between the oppressed and the oppressors in stratified societies, and that lowers the opportunities for violence, but provides marginalized groups with some sort of a leverage without arms. Right. Now, one thing I forgot to say now is when I say uh, this interdependence lowers the opportunities for, uh, for violence, um, it uh, lowers the opportunities for secessionist violence in, in, in particular, right? Because um, the idea of breaking away and creating your own state becomes increasingly unimaginable or infeasible the more integrated groups are, right? So that, that should make sense. And 
And that's why I would expect this factor to matter, especially for secessionist or territorial conflicts. So in summary, I expect the, um, the, the, the potential for violent conflict to be lowest in this upper left corner here, the so-called stratified societies that are characterized by both a high degree of hierarchization and, and low degree of segmentation, or I should say a high degree of integration, right? Segmentation obviously being the opposite of, of integration. By contrast, uh, conflict should be most likely here in the bottom right corner where groups are relatively equal uh, in power and are highly segmented. And then the opposite is true for nonviolent conflict. These stratified societies provide more relative opportunities for nonviolent um, mobilization on the part of marginalized groups, um, whereas in segmented unranked groups, the relative opportunities uh, lean more towards violence compared to nonviolence. So how do I go about that empirically? Um, well, in the global quantitative analysis, I have a kind of a two-pronged approach. First, I focus on the comparison between two different types of um, post-colonial states, comparing the colonial settler states on the one hand and what I call decolonized states on the other hand. Colonial settler states are those states that became independent under the rule of the same uh, colonial settlers that uh, uh, the colonized or descendants of the settlers that colonized the country in the first place, right? Uh, the US, Guatemala, South Africa, and so on, right? These countries became countries, became independent countries under the rule of the white European settlers. Um, Whereas the decolonized states, in the decolonized states, these settlers leave and they leave behind um, a group of, or, or, or a population that is very much divided uh, between different ethnic groups, obviously very much enforced by colonial policies of divide and rule, right? Um, so these two sets of states in my view, constitute almost opposite poles in my um, classification of stratified and segmented societies, with the settler states being prototypical cases of, of stratified societies, right? The white settlers at the top, everyone below, and of course, um, highly integrated, right? Whereas in uh, the decolonized states, after the departure, so to speak, of the former colonizers, you have much, uh, a much lower degree of hierarchy, and at the same time, the groups are strong or, or, or highly segmented. So that's the first um, comparison um, in, the, in the global quantitative analysis, and then I um, test the effect of my two components of the cleavage type, hierarchization and segmentation, and, and, and their effects on the risk of uh, violent uh, different types of violent conflict. Hmm. Okay, that's not a perfect layout here. Um, when it comes to group hierarchization, measuring group hierarchization, I rely on the ethnic power relations EPR data set. That's a data set that measures, or first of all, uh, it uh, provides a list of politically relevant ethnic groups in all countries of the world and then uh, provides annual codings of their access to um, political power, right? So here's the example of, um, of Iraq, right? Um, so you have the, uh, the, the, well, I can't read it now because it's over. <laughs> okay, so anyways, um, so you have a situation here with the, uh, the, the, the Shia Arabs that become, or, oh, okay, no. That's the period of Saddam Hussein's rules, or uh, I can't read it on my own slide, I apologize. But that's, the, <laughs> that's basically uh, Saddam Hussein's rule, right? And you can see that there is one dominant group here, the Sunni Arabs, whereas the other groups, Shia and Kurds, are politically 
uh, uh, discriminated. But that, uh, that was not always the case. In the period before Saddam Hussein, you see a power sharing regime between the Shia and the, and the Sunni, right? So DPR data uh, provide annual codings of ethnic groups' access to executive state power. Um, for my measure of uh, hierarchy, I construct uh, an indicator of the persistence of one group ethnic dominance. So I focus on groups that are like the Sunni Arabs under Saddam Hussein uh, that occupy a dominant position in the state. And I measure for how long a country has experienced uninterrupted political dominance by one uh, group. And obviously, the longer this period, the higher the degree of hierarchization. When it comes to segmentation versus integration, I rely on um, a, a related data set on the cultural content of these groups included in EPR, where we measure um, or we, we code the, uh, the, the language, uh, the languages that group members speak and the religions that they practice. And we code three subgroups of, e, uh, of each ethnic group for, um, or a maximum of three subgroups for the languages they speak and uh, a maximum of three subgroups for the religions they speak, and that allows me to kind of measure the linguistic and religious overlap between groups. That's different from fractionalism, from the standard fractionalization measures, because first of all, they focus on individuals and they work with group categories that are supposed to be mutually um, exclusive, right? So you, they do not allow you to measure to what extent different ethnic groups actually overlap in the languages they speak and the religions they practice. And our data set allows us to do that. So I create an indicator of linguistic and religious segmentation that ranges from zero to one and basically answers the question from how many other groups in the country on average is any ethnic group linguistically or religiously distinct. So for example, Belgium, the, Fla uh, the uh, the Flemish, uh, the Wallonians, uh, Walloons, and uh, the German-speaking groups, they're all linguistically uh, uh, distinct from each other. The same is true for Chad and so on, right? Whereas in Uruguay or Rwanda, um, ethnic groups uh, in Rwanda speak Banyarwanda, and in, the, in Uruguay they all speak Spanish, right? So um, uh, the value of the indicator is zero. Three hypotheses result from this comparison between colonial settled states and decolonized states, which are that ethnic mobilization is less likely to be associated with civil conflict in the colonial settler states than in the decolonized states. Ethnic civil conflict is also less likely to be, or, or is, is, is less lethal in uh, the colonial settler states than in the decolonized states. But on the other hand, um, peaceful ethnopolitical contention should be more prevalent in the colonial settler states than in the decolonized um, states. So in the quantitative analysis, in the first part, I basically use dummy variables for these two types of post-colonial states. And what I find is indeed that, that decolonized states and other multi-ethnic countries are significantly more likely to experience civil conflict onset compared to the settler states, despite the settler states uh, huge, uh, profound historical inequalities, right? And the decolonized states are also, uh, when they experience conflict, these conflicts are also more intense, more lethal in the decolonized states than in the colonial settler states. Again, despite the profound historical inequalities that we find in the colonial settler state. By contrast, Decolonized states and other multi-ethnic uh, countries are, or are see less uh, peaceful ethno-political protest than the colonial settler state. And that's important because you could think that, well, perhaps ethnicity is simply less politicized in these um, um, uh, uh, colonial settler states, right? But these colonial settler states, they actually do see more ethno-political uh, peaceful ethno-political group protest than decolonized states. So 
ethnicity is by no means less politicized, but when ethnicity is mobilized politically, it is usually through peaceful means, whereas in the decolonized states, um, uh, it is more likely to turn violent. Now, there are a number of alternative explanations. We can talk about that in, in detail afterwards, perhaps. But obviously, I do control for um, you know, other important variables, such as state consolidation uh, or state strength, the identity of the colonizers, which is an important variable in that institutional, uh, institutionalist literature, right? natural resource production, then regional effects and, and trans-border uh, dynamics, and ultimately, or, or finally, I also uh, uh, evaluate the, uh, the potential endogeneity of colonial legacies, right? Obviously, uh, the, whether you are a colonial settler state or a decolonized state in my, in my, uh, 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 in my data is not randomly distributed, right? Uh, that has to do with colonial settlement patterns in the first place. So what determined these uh, colonial settlement patterns there are a number of factors such as accessibility, disease environment, uh, resource uh, richness, and I draw on some of the data from that institutionalist literature, uh, Ache Moglu and Robinson and, and, uh, and others, uh, to kind of test or evaluate the potential endogeneity um, of, of my treatment of, of uh, colonial uh, uh, cleavage type. And I find that even when controlling for these causally antecedent factors, the results still stand. So there is something about these colonially, sorry, these, uh, these colonial cleavage types that profoundly affect forms of political contention today. And even, you go, even if you go back, because my statistical analysis focuses on the period starting from 1946, right? Which is not, uh, perhaps, you could argue when, you know, the, 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 the violent conflicts happen in the settler states. You could argue that, well, these states are much older, so actually all the violent conflicts happened way before 1946. However, if you um, go back to data uh, from the COW project that measures civil wars or that code civil wars all the way back to the 19th century, then you can actually see that even in uh, the first years after independence, in this graph here, the x-axis shows the year after independence, um, and these are averaged um, ethnic conflict occurrence scores uh, by year, right? And you see that even in the first year, in the first years after independence, uh, violent conflicts, violent, violent ethnic conflicts were very rare in the colonial settler states, and they were much more rare in the colonial settler states than in the decolonized states. And finally, the second part of the uh, analysis is uh, the part where I test the effect of these two components of my idea of ethnic cleavage type, hierarchies and segmentation directly. Uh, and the hypotheses here are that stable between group hierarchies decrease the likelihood of ethnic civil conflict. Segmentation increases the likelihood of ethnic civil conflict. And um, segmentation increases, in particular, the risk of territorial conflicts, whereas stable group hierarchies uh, decrease the likelihood of um, governmental conflicts. This graph here shows um, the result of, or the main result of this part of the analysis. It shows you the, um, the risk of the predicted risk of ethnic uh, civil conflict as a function of the stability of the, the ethnic hierarchy. So this is the consecutive, the number of consecutive dominance years, right? How many years was an ethnic group dominant in this country? And on the x-axis, the degree um, of segmentation. I'm focusing here on linguistic segmentation because it turns out that linguistic segmentation has a stronger effect on civil conflict risk than religious segmentation. Um, so this graph is focused on linguistic segmentation. And what it shows you is that indeed, the risk of ethnic civil conflict is highest in this bottom right corner where groups are highly segmented and the power hierarchy is unclear, right? By contrast, 
conflict risk is lowest in what I call stratified societies where ethnic groups are hierarchically ordered but highly integrated, right? And that's in a way uh, 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 surprising because if you, again, if you uh, follow grievances-based theories, you would expect these societies with, in, with very profound inequalities to be very conflict prone. However, um, precisely because of their high degree of social integration, um, they actually see significantly less violent conflict. Now, what is interesting is this upper right corner here. These are states that are both hierarchically ordered, but ethnic groups are also highly segmented. And you see a lot of um, so-called uh, nation states, such as Turkey, um, Thailand, um, or some of post some post-colonial countries, such as Sudan um, or uh, uh, Sri Lanka, that are situated here. So one group has achieved to um, to become dominant and uh, created some sort of a group hierarchy in the country, right? But at the same time, groups are highly segmented, and because they are highly segmented, you will still see a much higher conflict risk in this upper right corner than than here, right? So in summary, oh, before the summary, um, testing uh, hypothesis 2C, you can see that um, the, um, when it comes to governmental conflict onset hierarchy, so the, the, uh, the degree of hierarchization is most relevant for governmental conflict onset and uh, segmentation is most relevant for territorial ethnic conflict onset. And again, what is interesting here is that actually linguistic segmentation seems to be a stronger predictor for territorial conflict than religious segmentation. But the main takeaway point here is that hierarchy, hierarchization is most relevant for conflict at the center, conflicts uh, or rebellions that challenge power at the center, versus, whereas um, segmentation uh, decrease or segmentation increases or integration decreases uh, the risk of territorial conflict onset. So to summarize, the extremely unequal colonial settler states, right, where groups have been marginalized for decades, if not centuries, actually experience less violent ethnic conflict, but more peaceful um, ethnic contention uh, than the decolonized states and other multi-ethnic countries. And um, generally speaking, ethnic civil conflict is more likely the more segmented groups are and, and the less hierarchically ordered um, uh, ethnic groups are. Right? So the conclusion from that is that grievances matter, right? Grievances do propel ethnopolitical contention, but the form of this ethnopolitical contention uh, really uh, depends on these kind of historically determined ethnic cleavage types um, in which inequality is embedded. Um, so going back to the, the institutionalist literature, this result obviously also uh, kind of traces present day outcomes back to colonial legacies, but it's less an institutional explanation and more of some sort of a, a structural, a structural approach, right? And I think that's where I will stop and uh, Great. Thank you so much take some time. questions. So the question is why um, I focus on the distinction between colonial settler states and decolonized states at all, right? And do not just look at, uh, I could just look at uh, these two components of the ethnic cleavage type, hierarchization and segmentation, 
um, uh, directly, right? So I do that. Um, the answer is that that's, that's one part of the analysis. But the, the other part of the analysis and uh, an important part of the book is really to trace. So the question then is where do these cleavage types come from, right? And, and I do think that colonialism has uh, uh, an important, a very important historical role here. Uh, more than two thirds of all countries, uh, uh, of all uh, of today's countries are uh, uh, states that were created by European overseas colonialism. So um, certainly European overseas colonialism has been one of the main forces of state building in, 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 in modern history, right? And my argument here is that in many states, the ethnic cleavage type is a direct product of patterns of colonialism and decolonization. And so to test this part of the argument, I distinguish between these two, these two types, right? So if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be able to trace back these different cleavage types to some sort of like their historical origin, if you will, right? Um, sorry, yeah. So the question basically uh, is how does my argument differ from uh, Achimoglu and Robinson's um, why nations fail argument, right? So theoretically, and um, correct me if, you're, uh, if you think I'm wrong, the way I interpret Achimoglu and Robinson's work is that they argue that um, British settlers who had to kind of uh, uh, content themselves with the less attractive territories because they were latecomers, right? The Spanish and also the Portuguese colonized the more uh, uh, attractive, resource-rich territories and were able to kind of exploit uh, 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 existing uh, power structures there to extract resources and so on, and were basically then able to build incredibly extractive institutions, right? Whereas the British settlers, who came much later, had to content themselves with less resource-rich countries. And uh, as an, a result of that, they had to build more democratic institutions um, in, um, in those territories, which benefited these countries in the long term, right? So these equal democratic institutions uh, uh, provided for long-term economic growth, right? So that's kind of how I interpret Achimoglu and Robinson's uh, 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 why nations fail argument. So how my argument differs, first of all, I look at the different outcome, right? I look at ethno-political mobilization in particular, whereas they look mostly at economic uh, development and, 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 and other and, and institutional uh, factors. Now, for example, when it comes to ethnopolitical mobilization, as I said, um, I think their historical story focusing on equality in these British settler states it completely ignores the equally profound inequality between settlers and subjugated population, right? So the argument is, the British settlers came, created equal democratic institutions. When it comes to ethnopolitical mobilization, that's certainly not true, right? These institutions were not very equal for the subjugated uh, 
uh, uh, uh, population for the imported slaves from Africa for the, 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 the marginalized indigenous people, right? So if you look at ethnopolitics, um, you get a completely different interpretation in terms of equality, right? You would think that the US, Australia, um, and so South Africa are equally unequal as Peru, Guatemala, and so on, right? So that's the first difference. The, the, the outcome is different, therefore the perspective on equality is very different, right? Um, then the second one is, although, I, well, some people would argue their, their definition of institutions is relatively vague, right? Um, I, when I hear the term institutions, I have something more narrow in mind, right? I, 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 uh, I would refer to the institutions um, for uh, things such as kind of the rules that govern political behavior, right? And what I'm looking at here is the, the, the relationship between ethnic groups, right? So that would not fall under my definition of institutions, right? I'm not looking at um, property rights. I'm not looking at uh, electoral systems. I'm not looking at um, uh, pr uh, you know, parliamentary versus presidential systems or something like that. I look at the structure of ethnic group relations, right? And what I find is that when it comes to the outcome of ethnopolitical contention, whether peaceful or violent, this structure of ethnic group relations has a, 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 a stronger effect than such institutional factors. And again, I think it makes sense because it's a different outcome and very clearly this equality that uh, Ache Moglu and Robinson point to in the case of British settler colonies was certainly not true for the African Americans, right? For, for uh, the Aboriginal people in Australia, right? No one here would argue that there was a lot of equality for Ab Aboriginals in Australia or for African Americans in the US, right? In fact, it was as unequal as, 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 as Bolivia, right? So that's, the, that's the, 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 the difference here. Now, the methodological question, I cannot do fixed effects in these models because um, my uh, legacy variables and both my legacy variables and my cleavage type variables are time invariant, right? And at the country level. Oh, I thought the previous variables were not time invariant. So I was thinking I think we take the direction, but I, I don't want to force any questions too much because um, I, I thought the previous variables were not time invariant. They are. They are, yeah. So and that's something we will talk about later today, right? Finding these data for like, you know, uh, the extent of religious or in linguistic overlap between ethnic groups is so difficult it's impossible to have a time variant measure of, of, of something like that. Colonized societies seem to vary in the policies that the colonial powers 
targeted towards those distinct ethnic identities. So how does, uh, how does your argument fit in with those variations in policies? Weren't those policies different enough to create very different outcomes related to ethnicity and identity? Very quickly, repeat the question for to attend the moment. What they were about the head So the first question was about the uh, the concept of costs here, right? For for different uh, well, the way you framed the question, costs for violent uh, mobilization and how that could change over time. Whether it's uh, uh, something needs to change the relative. Uh, costs for the marginalized group um, to rebel, or whether it's the, it's this equilibrium is some sort of like is, is interrupted, right? And but one part of the question was also whether I conceive of costs in a relative or absolute way. So I see costs as um, relative, right? Costs and opportunities are relative, but not um, necessarily compared to the state but more compared to the alternative of peaceful mobilization, right? So as the opportunities for violence decrease and the opportunities for peaceful um, contention, peaceful direct action increase, the risk of violent conflict uh, uh, decreases, right? Which means that how does that change over time? Um, and that's something that I talk a little bit about in the conclusions of the book, um, because you could argue that, well, if or as inequality in these settler states is reduced, right? So the hierarchization is basically uh, 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 rectified and you create more inequality, uh, more equality between uh, uh, groups, would you not expect the relative uh, costs for violence to decrease, right? My, my uh, response to that question that I kind of uh, raised myself in the book is that the, the other uh, factor, the other variable, the other cleavage type variable of segmentation weighs too much, right? You, um, I think as long as this integration is in place, um, the, the costs, the relative costs for violence compared to peaceful direct action are too high, right? Which also brings us to the question, why, what, what can be done to mitigate the conflict risk in segmented states? And I talked a little bit about that in the context of Africa, my case studies. Uh, and my argument here is really, if there is this structural segmentation between groups, the way you can bridge it is through elites. So in a case like Gabon, where you have a very integrated elite, conflict risk is much lower than in Cote d'Ivoire, where the, the elite was much more uh, segmented, right? So um, that would mean that if there is structural segmentation, sometimes you can bridge it um, through elite level um, integration. And then the question of all, uh, uh, all these nuances in terms of colonial legacies, right? That's a very, I mean, it's a fair point. Uh, on the other hand, you know, this is one book, right? And uh, I have to kind of focus on, on, on one part of um, the causal uh, explanation of the world as we see it, right? So obviously I wouldn't claim that this is the, 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 the all encompassing explanation for why the world is as we see it today. So I take these existing explanations, many of them, you know, are part of the ex uh, existing uh, uh, literature. I take them on board and I try to account for them as best as I can empirically. And I use some of the very same indicators that these authors have used themselves, right? So if you look at the institutional legacy and the, the, the quantitative literature, right? What do people do? Well, of course, there are more nuanced um, uh, uh, studies, but they're usually uh, reach spatially limited, right? Not, they're not global, right? When you, when the fine-grained data on like missionaries, colonial investment in education, all these variables, they are not globally available, right? 
Um, so what people have done in global quantitative analysis is that they have basically used colonizers, dummies. They have used dummies for violence in the, violent, in the, violent independence or, uh, or not. And I use these same variables um, to, to, to account for this kind of more macro level um, uh, uh, explanations of different colonial approaches, right? And I do, and I, what I find is that even taking these uh, differences into account, the core distinction between colonial settler states and decolonized states still stands, right? And then I show that that the two key components of what I call the ethnic cleavage type, they actually have the, ex the effects that I expect, right? So you see stable group hierarchies decreasing uh, the risk of violent conflict, especially at the center, and high integration decreasing the risk of violent conflict, especially territorial uh, conflicts, right? Um, I was wondering about the, the, the measurement of conflict and time frame. Yeah, you know, yeah. 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 I asked you this question because, for example, if you were to do, if you were to go back um, and look at it today, not today, but let's, let's say during the 1980s or early 1990s, it's very hard, for example, to then classify Guatemala as a, as a peaceful society. I think that's a, it's a it's a very important point, right? And I talk a little bit about that um, again in the book when it comes to like what do I not do, <laughs> right? Um, but oh, sorry, was there another question? Or should I respond immediately? Um, but the but first, I mean, the conflict in Guatemala and also conflict in Peru um, and other conflicts, for example, Nicaragua. I do talk about these conflicts in detail in the in the in the in the kind of in the accompanying text right um, and what is interesting about cases like Guatemala and Peru is that indigenous people were mobilized right um, now but, so one interesting detail is already they were mobilized but actually by uh, settler uh, representatives right so the guerrilla leadership was obviously all white and they tried to mobilize indigenous peoples for a European ideology, which was communism. Whereas, uh, and, and, and it's the same, in, in the same in Peru, right? The leadership of the guerrilla was very, uh, a, a very kind of settler based, if you will, and certainly not indigenous uh, people based. So that's already a difference you wouldn't expect well, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I wouldn't, you wouldn't expect a Turkish socialist to lead the Kurdish uh, uh, secession movement, right? So that's already quite interesting in itself. But you could argue, well, you lose these conflicts, right? So actually, indigenous people were mobilized and you don't account for them. But I do. So I have a more, I have two definitions of ethnic conflict. One is where um, for an ethnic conflict to be coded as such, they need, there needs to be ethnic recruitment and an ethnic, explicit ethnic claim. And then I have another lenient definition that includes conflict uh, as ethnic if there was ethnic recruitment, as in Peru, as in Guatemala. And 
of course, then you see more conflicts, but the difference is still, because you see lots of similar conflicts in decolonized states too, and this difference is still significant. Interestingly, you see conflicts in these states where segmentation is, is more pronounced. For example, Nicaragua, the Atlantic coast people, Miskitu, for example, right? Well, backed by the US government, they were able to mount a, a, a violent challenge to the, uh, sorry, to the, um, uh, to the um, Sandinistas uh, uh, who uh, 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 kind of took power after Somoza, right? So they toppled Somoza, uh, uh, tried to impose their kind of uh, communist regime and were challenged by Miskito people from the Atlantic coast. But interestingly, Nicaragua is a case where there is actually some sort of segmentation because the, the Spanish colonizers never really controlled the Atlantic coast, right? That was partly British for some part. So interestingly, where you see this violent conflict is precisely where segmentation is more pronounced than typically in settler states. Now, what I do not examine in my book is these kind of urban uprisings that never, you know, develop into a sustained violent challenge, right? In South Africa, in, well, South Africa is actually coded as an ethnic conflict. And what is interesting here is you could say, well, South Africa is the counter example, but then I would argue that, well, based on grievances theories, you would expect South Africa to experience a much more protracted, much more violent, much more lethal conflict. If you compare South Africa to Sri Lanka or, or other countries um, where inequality is equally pronounced, I mean, the conflict in South Africa was relatively low scale, right? Which goes back to that hypothesis that settler states experience less lethal conflicts. Now, what I do not do, and that's the end of my long answer here, what I do not do is really, uh, I do not focus on all the violence the kind of structural violence, the discrimination, all the kind of, all the, the, the coercive, the, the means of coercion that the dominant group employs to keep the marginalized groups marginalized, right? I do not measure that. And if you take that into account, of course, the settler states are characterized by a lot of violence, right? But I'll, I focus on challenges by the marginalized groups against the dominant group, right? And so I make this kind of disclaimer in the book that, of course, these settler states, they are characterized by a lot of kind of low scale violence and coercion still today against the marginalized groups, right? Imprisonment in the US, for example, is, is, is a way of violence, right? You, you, you keep people in prison, you discipline them, you coerce them. It's very much, it's very much a, a form of violence, right? And my book doesn't speak to that. So the, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first question is about the measurement of integration and how that relates to the um, what I mentioned before about the po possibility of bridging structural segmentation through elite integration, right? 
So I measure integration ideally, I would have had data, well, first of all, time variant data, right? And second, not only cultural integration, but also socioeconomic integration. Remember, when I'm talking about the case of uh, South Africa, I refer to um, the, the, the African workforce working in, in basically settler controlled uh, uh, mines and other uh, companies and so on, right? So this is some sort of a socioeconomic, in this case, labor integration, which I would love to be able to measure across uh, nationally, globally over time, right? I just didn't find data. The data uh, I had was limited to cultural integration. So I had to make this compromise, but I think that um, the degree of cultural integration still says a lot about uh, the social integration of, of ethnic groups. So I think that's a very defendable um, compromise. And then basically, we have these data on, so the EPR data provide a list of politically relevant ethnic groups in all countries of the world, uh, but they don't necessarily say anything about, you know, the cultural content of ethnicity. So what is ethnic identity based on? Is it religion? Is it language? And the EPR ED um, data um, uh, offer a way out of that because they code um, the languages that a given ethnic group speaks and the religions that they practice up to uh, 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 three kind of segments of each group, right? And um, I had a slide here that perhaps, can I show a slide that perhaps uh, shows this? Let me see, yes, here we go. So, for example, going back to the uh, argument, sorry, the, to the case of uh, Nigeria, right? So you have the House of Fulani group, and we use ethnologue data to code the languages of this group called Hausa Fulani. Um, well, not surprisingly, Hausa is, is, the, is the largest segment, but there's also Fulfulde, obviously, and so the two, two different uh, Fulfulde uh, languages. In terms of religion, the House of Fulani are homogeneously Sunni Muslims. Now, the Yoruba, another uh, ethnic group coded in EPR from Nigeria, um, they all speak Yoruba, so they're linguistically homogenous. In terms of religion, they're actually divided between Sunni Islam uh, and, and different forms of Christianity. Now, Usually, if you look at ethnic fractionalization indices, the standard in the, uh, fractionalization indices, they would quote these two groups as mutually exclusive, right? So you're either Yoruba or your House of Fulani, and then you calculate how fractionalized the country is. Um, so they are unable to capture the fact that the Yoruba actually share some sort of a religious overlap with the House of Fulani because a part of the Yoruba practices Islam, right? So the Yoruba and the, and the House of Fulani are not as segmented as standard conventional fractionalization indices would tell us. These are two mutually exclusive groups. No, when it comes to religion, there is actually a, a significant overlap here, right? So by looking at these sub-segments or segments of, of ethnic groups, we are able to capture the degree of uh, religious and linguistic overlap. And obviously, if Nigeria was only these two groups, right, um, you would, the, the, the linguistic overlap uh, indicator would be zero, right? Because there, they don't, there's no segment in any of the uh, groups that is the same as the there's no segment in one group that uh, is the same as any segment of the other group, right? But in religion, the, the, the indicator would be somewhere between zero and one because there is this overlap here, right? So that's how I measure um, integration, um, social integration. Again, focused on linguistic and religious overlap. The elite idea is nothing but speculation in the book. I don't test this, right? But when it comes to the conclusions, 
and implications. One speculative conclusion I would draw from my work based on the field research, even though that was not the main uh, purpose, but one of the, uh, the, the conclusions I would draw is that in countries that are equally segmented, such as Cote d'Ivoire and Gabon, and by the way, have very similar uh, institutional legacies, right? Both were French colonies, uh, both, uh, for example, have the same kind of electoral system, both experienced a, a, a prolonged one party uh, uh, regime after independence, right? French backed and so on. So lots of similarities. And yet, um, for some reasons, the Gabonese elite was much more integrated uh, than the Ivorian one. I look at networks among individuals in my field research. Uh, but this, you know, generalization, I can say that in Gabon and Cote d'Ivoire, that played a role, but I wouldn't be able to make a general claim uh, from that. But it's, it's a bit speculative, but my hunch is that segmented, structurally segmented countries can overcome the segmentation through elite integration. And then the uh, Leslie Ann's question was um, about the kind of uh, macro level indicator of hierarchization, right? And what it, what it, what it potentially misses um, in terms of concrete developments on the ground, right? Well, I should say that EPR, the, way I, the, the measure is based on, on EPR's uh, power status codings, right, which are annual. And by definition, EPR will code any change in the power relations that, that coders are, are, are aware of, right? Now, EPR looks at executive power in the central government. So, concretely speaking, if, a African, if an African-American judge was appointed to the Supreme Court, EPR would not pick that up. If 10 African-American um, uh, um, uh, politicians are elected to, to Congress, EPR would not pick that up. EPR picks up Barack Obama's election to become a, a, a American president, right? Because it focuses on executive power at the, at the center, right? So in this sense, that's the kind of neosis that the indicator overlooks, right? I think it's defensible. I think that in the grand scheme of things, the election of 10 or 20, you know, uh, indigenous parliamentarians in Ecuador hasn't really changed things, right? Um, but of course, that's a very high level perspective. Um, and everyone working on a specific case would say, of course, once these parliamentarians were elected, that was very important. And I wouldn't deny that, right? But again, for this kind of cross-national global approach, that's the kind of data that was, that was available over time, right? With this kind of fine-grained annual codings of changes in ethnic groups' power relations, right? Um, so it, I think it's, in a way, it's, just, you know, okay, it's, it, that's what was available. <laughs> but I do think it's, it's defensible, right? Because in the grand scheme of things, whether mm, representatives of an ethnic group have access to central government is, 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 is a key threshold, I think, in terms of group hierarchy. Right. Okay.